Hey, in this episode of the Weekend Briefing, an awesome interview with Leo Puglisi. He is the year 11 student who runs his own TV news network. So he started it in year seven. It's called Six News and it's really good. And he's doing it from his bedroom on an iPhone with a little lapel mic. And the quality is so high that he was able to get Scott Morrison, the prime minister, and also Anthony Albanese, the opposition leader, to come on his show during the last election. So he's doing big things. He's got some big ideas, but a kind of old-fashioned way of doing it. Um, We ask him lots of questions, like his most annoying question that he's asked and this annoying conspiracy he faces nonstop. Uh, We ask him about those politicians I mentioned, what his views are, and also what his generation is thinking, where they're landing politically, what's driving it, um, is it the woke agenda being pushed on students, as conservative critics would say, or is there something else going on? It's a really interesting interview from a very young and insightful journalist. Hey, Leo, thank you so much for joining us on the Weekend Briefing. Great to be here. Now, obviously, the first question you would generally get asked in an interview relates to your age. Um, I'm tempted to go there as well, but I'm wondering, is... Is that annoying for you? Are you sick of talking about your age in this context? Oh, look, sometimes it gets a, it gets a bit tedious, right? I think I think I've been asked, you know, why why did you start this or, or why so young? Maybe I, you know, over a hundred times I would say that, but I mean, it's not annoying. Like it's it's a natural question, right? Mm. If if I was an outsider here, I'd also be wondering why a sixteen year old or you know, you could have seen me doing this at fifteen or fourteen or thirteen yeah. or twelve. Why are they? presenting the news or interviewing the Prime Minister? It's a, it's a fair question to ask. Yeah. Maybe I think I've heard you talk about this before. The most annoying question is, are your parents controlling you? Are you a puppet for the political views of your mum or your dad? I love that question. <laughs> I truly cannot believe how many people believe that I'm actually controlled by someone, let alone mm. my parents, thinking that they would have the technological capabilities to run what I run <laughs> or to write what I write. It's, 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 it's incredible. Um, maybe, maybe it just shows how good I am that they have to believe that someone else <laughs> is controlling things. But it's just not true. Definitely take it as a compliment. I mean, the other s- stupid thing about that argument really is that there's no real obvious political agenda or, or agenda of any kind apart from doing good quality news that I can see. You seem to, you know, you're... You're going for that very old-fashioned, impartial journalism style. So to sort of argue that there's some kind of deep agenda doesn't really make sense. Exactly. And and that's the whole thing we presented, even when I was doing this in primary school. Right? The whole thing was just straightforward news. You know, we'll, we'll bring in other views, but we're not sharing our own views. We're just giving you the facts. Mm. And that seems to upset people. It just really <laughs> makes them upset. They just seethe and cope when they see us doing it. Because I, I don't think they, maybe it's just they don't know what impartial mm. journalism looks like, but that's what we're trying to present. That's always what we've been trying to um, to present. But um, yeah, I, I don't know, w- you know who they could possibly think I am, I'm shilling for on one way or another. Then again, of course, we've, we've been, I've been told that I'm you know, pro-liberal, pro-labor, pro-greens, pro-UAP, mm. li- literally any political party, political label under the sun I've been called. Um, so I think that's, I, again, I'll take that as a compliment. Well, the great thing about your claim to impartiality is that you don't vote yet. So, you know, you can't be accused of <laughs> pushing for a party that you're, you're voting for. It is an interesting point you make about doing impartial news. Um, I guess because you're doing it, you're doing it in a very contemporary way, technically. So the way you're broadcasting that you're on YouTube, you're across all the social platforms. In that sense, you are very contemporary and sort of new media, but your style is quite old media and as you say you cop flack for being impartial which sounds ridiculous but it is actually out of step with a lot of what's happening in journalism in the new media i think because people get a lot more clicks when they lean hard into opinion what do you make of that and why have you decided not to go that direction yeah i mean i agree that opinion gets the clicks right Mm. that's just that's just a fact um i think you know, we, we've tried to lean into it purely because I know that there were a lot of these spaces where people were wanting impartial journalism. People weren't getting it in Australia. You know, obviously, unlike a, a media market like the US, which has, 
you know, newspapers for every man and dog out there, right? Or news channels and all that. Mm. You know, Australia has, has very few options here. There's two real news channels at the moment on, on TV. Um, and when I, when I, when we really were expanding this in, uh, in 2020, right? So you can imagine, you know, lockdowns were starting since like March, April. Um, people were wanting trusted, accurate information. They weren't wanting, um, you know, uh, um, you know, hyperbole. They weren't wanting it to be um, a scare campaign. We, they just wanted the facts, and that's what we always try to um, deliver. But while other news channels were either it was debates on, you know, should we end lockdown now or or should we keep it going? Blah, blah, we we are we were just simply delivering the facts. Those mm. were the headlines. The case numbers were our headlines, and it got tedious after two years. It was <laughs> very 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 tedious and very very boring. And you can imagine I'm doing this while also doing online school. But it's purely because, you know, there weren't these other options out there that we decided to do it. And by we, I, I, I do mean me initially, right? This, this right. wasn't something that was just to, oh, this, this would be a great, um, you know, money-making opportunity. Because, again, <laughs> this was early year seven. I'd literally just started high school. And so it, it just so happens to have grown um, to a level where we're able to do the, the news bulletins every hour. We're able to bring people back. Um, and and people more and more people are turning to us, which I, which I think is great. But I, I just still cannot believe it's happened. But more people would turn, as you said, if you were going hard with opinion, because you know, especially being um, in high school and having this perspective that you did, if you were landing strong blows on the government or the opposition or or anyone, people would really take notice. So, has that been tempting for you? You know, it can be a bit tempting, and you know, maybe not necessarily opinions. In terms of a political issue, but you know, I'm a bit more, let's say, loose on 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 Twitter than I am on air. Um, but I think what people do like about us is we also, you know, we are we were able to ask the hard questions as we mm. did to um, the then prime minister and to the now prime minister and to the former prime minister Kevin Rudd. Um, and and we 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 continue to do that to to all our guests, and I think people really like that. Um, at the same time, I think for all, for all the 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 flack I've copped over the years and. And um, and comments about my age and all the patronising and condescending stuff. I'm lucky I probably wasn't doing opinion because you can imagine oh, mm. what what is what does he know about this? Um, and I think uh, a good example of that someone I I, I sp- uh, have spoken to a few times, Caleb Bond, mm. um, when he was doing this at a similar age, and he was actually doing opinion columns and all that. Sure um, was, and yeah. I I would I would like to not imagine the reaction that I'd get if I did that. But then again, maybe I've developed a super fan base enough that I'd be fine. So we'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, interesting you bring up Caelan Bond. We used to have him on um, Triple J Hack all the time when he was um, your age and, and younger. And he really was leaning into a conservative viewpoint and, and really happy to bring it and good at arguing it. And so he took a very different line going straight into opinion. Um, what, what have you learned from him? Have you talked to him much? I've, sp- I've spoken to him a few times, um, you know, mainly when... You know, there's there's been a bit of social media attacks on me because I mean, as as I said, he's he's had it a bit few a few times. But I think the best thing, maybe it was he him to told me, maybe it was others. But the thing I just go with, you know, at this point, you got to ignore these kind of people. Um, it's just sad at times, as we yeah. discussed before, how they they want to believe that someone else is controlling me, or they want to believe I'm going one way or another. When it's clear mm. that you know I don't. The six news team, which is a it's a growing team, we don't go to one side or another. And again, it's just weird that people don't accept that. But of course, if people want to share their opinions, we have plenty of opinion guests on. We got plenty of MPs, plenty of people from different mm. parties. Um, we always get lots of guests on around election time, um, and they're the ones who are able to share their opinion, which we'll ask the hard questions of. Um, but it's just yeah. not our opinions being shared, and I think that's what people really come to to like about Six News. So you said there you've copped some flack online. How how ugly has it gotten? Uh, a, a bit ugly. I mean, really? it got to the point where. Yeah, well, I think there was a, a good Sky News segment on it. I think I was on um, Andrew Bolt's show once, mm. asked about it. Um, I still can't believe I was on Andrew Bolt's show. <laughs> um, but it was when we had these constant claims of, of of someone else controlling me and there were particular Twitter users who, um, you know, when you think about it, you know, they, they're having their screenshots aired live on Sky News, which, mm. is, um, which was a bit bizarre. Um, but it was talks of people saying, um, you know, I'm piling on women because someone I fact-checked happened to be a woman mm. and they're going to go to my school and get it involved. I, one of the few things that I put online is my school, so, you know, technically a doxing threat. I don't think they know it. They're, they're all talk. Mm. Um, but uh, there, there was that. There was um, at one point when I made some of the 
infamous I'm not voting for Labor jokes, if we go back to like 2022 federal election, um, I people, you know, were going at me so hard over that to the point where he's 14 started trending as people were <laughs> desperately trying to explain that, no, Leo Puglisi cannot vote for Labor, mm. even if he wanted to. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the kind of thing. But, you know, I always get some of the, the weirdest you know, real, real freaks in my comments at times. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, it, it's, it's been bizarre. And, and when you think about it, I, I was looking at something that happened a couple of years ago when I was 14, right? Uh, and someone was trying to, I guess, troll me by um, creating a, uh, uh, an account pretending to be my mum. And you just think about it, you know, you, you laugh it off now, but, like, I was 14 at the time. Yeah. Like, it's seriously creepy. These people are weird. But, again, it, it just shows I've broken these people's brains, which, which I think is good. <laughs> Well, congratulations. But it, uh, the reason I'm kind of getting into this topic is um, wondering whether it could be harmful because, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and you've been through lots of different difficult moments where you're getting a lot of criticism online. And yeah, sometimes it's, you know, nonsensical outright trolling. Sometimes it's really passion debate. Sometimes it's deranged debate and it, it can affect you. It can make you anxious. You can open up your phone to Twitter and people are piling on you and that can ruin your day. Um, and that's me in my thirties. So have there been moments where that's ever gotten to you? And are, are you sort of cognizant of that and sort of taking care of yourself? Cause you are opening yourself up to a lot of argy bargy. Yeah. Look at, at times, you know, it's almost felt like that, but I think usually it's, it's, um, you know, it's, 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 it's just a lot of people making a lot of, 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 weird claims, false claims about me, which I, I'm able to laugh off because I know they're wrong. Mm. I, I know and I, I look back and I, I speak to other people um, and it's over things that are obviously just not things that you need to pile on over. So at, at times, yeah, it, it can be a bit, I wouldn't necessarily say say tough, but, you know, it is, is, a, is a lot to, to deal with. You know, again, when you're 16, 15, 14, 13, mm. you know, um, getting that kind of, of reaction on social media. And I, I don't doubt that, you know, I invite it and, you know, I ask for criticism. Mm. I mean that in the genuine criticism mm. sense, mm. not just weird partisan attacks. Um, but, criticism. you know, I'm, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm used to dealing with it. But um, I think, yeah, at the end of this point, they just have to be laughed at because mm. it's just claims that I know aren't, aren't true. And there's been times where we've had genuine feedback and mm. I'll, I'll cop that and we'll we'll move on as, as will six news. But that's usually over, you know, uh, an, edi an editorial thing or maybe there's some incorrect information that we should have corrected faster. And, you know, we'll, we'll cop that kind of thing. But I won't cop and I don't think I should have to cop claims that other people are controlling me or um, people saying they're going to go to my school um, because it's just, it's it's bizarre. Well, and that last one, I, that's messed I, up. People again, it's, about. it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you keep coming back to this accusation that people are controlling you. Does that really annoy you, that one? It sounds like it does. It, it is a bit annoying because, you know, when, when you work for... We, Six News, like, turned five years old last week, right? So I've been doing this for five years. And at, at the most parent involvement ever in that has been driving me to an interview location mm. or helping me print out a script or something like that. Take into account, again, Thanks, 12, 13 yeah. at times. But it, you just think, and you've got all these other people at 16 to do incredible work, but you've got a handful of people who will passionately believe that it is someone else controlling it for some agenda. I think if, even in the Herald Sun, I think it was in like 2021 in their, their backroom Baz segment, that they had some offline about... Um, well, Baz suspects there's a team behind Puglisi working to build Six News to make it better. Like, yeah, they're on air. They're other children. Like, there's, there's, <laughs> there's no one. There is no one from X Media or my parents or a political advisor who has ever had a shredded involvement in Six News, and I wouldn't let them anyway. <laughs> okay, so what is Six News? How many people is it? Where is it filmed? I mean, what... What camera have we got on now? Can you sort of point it around the room? What are we looking at here? If I point it around the room, this camera <laughs> will kind of collapse off the makeshift stand I've got. Um, but in, in short, so it's, it's a couple of setups, right? We've never had an actual newsroom. It's all been virtual. Again, COVID yeah. kind of really, 
you know, force that in play. Um, so I've got about a dozen people around the world, uh, well, around the country, plus uh, uh, in Toronto, I've got a North American correspondent, Wyatt mm. Sharp. We've had other people in, in Europe. <laughs> uh, we've had previously people in, in South Carolina and the rest of our team's wow. based around the country, a few in New South Wales, Victoria, a, a lot in Queensland um, as well and spread right around that area. Um, in short, pretty much just... 24-hour news channel, news bulletins all the time. As, as I'm speaking to you, we've got news bulletins airing right now, um, and that's something that we've been able to expand to do uh, with the name, as we talked before, on, on impartial journalism, but also you know breaking news. I think that's something that mm. we, we do a fair bit um, and uh, and yeah, it's it's a few makeshift setups. You know, currently, you know, I'm in the middle of, of changing up my studio, which has been largely green screens, but also um, a couple a couple monitors. Um, other people have actual setups. Uh, other people have have green walls for their green screens. So it's all a bit makeshift, um, but it's worked. And it, I think what people like about it is it's authentic. You know, I don't hide the fact I use a green screen. I post mm. behind the scenes clips all the time. Um, we don't pretend to be something we're not. Um, but it's all genuine, and it's all something that we've been able to build largely with our own money, and and some of that's obviously come from um, our our Patreon supporters. Um, but we didn't even do Patreon originally. A lot of this has just come from makeshift makeshift stuff. You know, our green screen was was just a really raggedy green sheet until um, <laughs> actually recently. You know, I'm interviewing the Prime Minister, and this green sheet's about to fall down. I'm hoping it doesn't fall down. But that's the kind of setup we have to have here. <laughs> Um, because we, we don't have big donors. Uh, we, you know, maybe it'd be nice if we did, but we don't. That's, that's just the reality of it. Well, speaking of money, are you able to bring in any revenue yet? Is it, a, is it turning into a business? I think at times, um, yeah, we've been able to, you know, it's a month by month thing, right? Which, which happens when you use Patreon. So we've been able to, to bring in a fair bit, obviously. Well, not, 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 not that much, right? Um, I will <laughs> say that. Because uh, obviously you take into account, it goes to the team because the, the team does a fantastic work. Yeah. Um, there's other stuff, you know, we have to pay for a lot of subscriptions for, for live streaming stuff and yeah. press conferences and all that. Um, so we've been, at times we've been able to, you know, um, you know, cash splash maybe, but, um, we really, it's, it's, we, we don't get that much, but our Patreon supporters are fantastic. You know, YouTube is really annoying because their ad money is like literal pennies right. for even for hundreds of thousands of views. They give us barely anything. Um, and we don't have Twitter Blue or anything like that, so um, yeah, we're 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 going. You know, I guess it's a it's a day to day operation, but uh, the fact is, you know, we if we if we don't need, you know, um, to to you know spend money on on a brand new camera, we won't. Like I I use my iPhone for the camera. I use um, pretty basic lapel mics, mm. and you know we we don't go over the top here. And that goes back to what I said earlier about it being authentic. So that's the most common technology: iPhones and these. Um wireless lapel mics yeah exactly well actually the wireless one broke so we had to go back to an old wide one from 2019 which i'm still i still use right. every then, single week then but, just um, cheap yeah. editing software that you can get online and off you go cutting the videos and post them to youtube for me i have used imovie since 2019 <laughs> i don't know why i still use it i could be using something a lot better something an actual network uses or something close to that but i still use imovie it's painstakingly slow at times but you know, when you've been doing it for five years, you know, no point changing. We use Keynote for graphics, and that is what the operation is largely built on, Keynote and, and iMovie. Um, and I, I even, and it, iPhones and little Exactly, mics. and even the, the Mac that I edit on most of the time, and I've got a, I've got a PC for the streaming side of things because obviously, you know, you have to have some kind of good Ethernet connection there. Um, but even the Mac, that was a, a more than a decade old until I replaced <laughs> it only a couple months ago um, to the point where there was a hissing fan on 24-7. I think you can even hear it when I'm interviewing Morrison and Albanese. Like it was it was bad. Like, really, really, realistically speaking, we should have replaced it a while back. But, um, yeah, that's, that. you know, we, it's, we just, it, if it works, it works. Okay, so let's talk about the big interviews you've got. Um, it's, you know, built a lot of credibility into what you're doing to get um, Scott Morris and Anthony Albanese and Kevin Rudd. Um, this is around the 2022 election. So pretty high stakes to have the Prime Minister. Congratulations. I mean, I, I know what it takes to get those people to come on a show. You know, Triple J, it took, it took me and the team a lot of work to convince them to come on a youth broadcaster. And, you know, you, you're a whole another level of doing that. Um, let's go through each individual there. Um, I just watched the Scott Morrison one back. And on one hand, it was great that he he didn't treat you like a kid. He took you really seriously yeah. to the point where he was 
<laughs> just as dismissive of, of you as he would be of any journalist, um, probably at the ABC or, you know, I guess the, the outlets that he f- doesn't really like that much. Um, he, mm. he sort of really arced back at you when you questioned his credibility and challenged him. And you mentioned, you know, you quoted sources from Crikey and the ABC and so he's then attacking the sources of, as not being credible. Uh, what did you make of his performance? I mean, it was outstanding, you know, astounding um, that he did that. It was probably the best interview we could ask for. <laughs> um, it, it could have, it could have been, you know, I mean, the the excitement was already enough. Like we we could have had all these great promos about, oh, how, how exciting is this? Scott Morrison on, and we ask him a few questions. Um, instead, of him, I mean, he chooses to go on the attack line like that, mm. um, which makes for some some fantastic grabs that were mm. replayed again and again on other channels. Um, I I still can't believe he decided to go that down that line. Now, again, I'm not saying, oh, boo, he's attacking the kids. I think it was great that he did. Mm. As you say, he took us seriously. I appreciate that. You know, we had a brief conversation before we on it. Really, really nice to us. He asked our names, all, all very, very polite, because um, there was uh, myself and, and our political other Roman McKinnon was there as well. But um, we, we planned maybe two questions on the, the thing about credibility, and it ended up being the majority of the interview, right? And I just was was amazed that he that he chose to take that line. And I and I think I learned from it a bit in terms of the fact that I didn't have many prepared follow ups for yeah. if he went on the attack line. In fact, mm. I really didn't. So I was kind of repeating myself and making some stuff up on the spot. I think I held myself held ground pretty well. Um, it was especially that one part where I'm like. Um, so you don't think uh, Australians are interested in whether you tell the truth or not? I do tell the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah It's yeah. just you, you can't make that up. So I think I cannot believe he came on. I'm so glad he did. Sincerely appreciate it. Um, but I'm just blown away by the fact that he reacted mm. um, like that. Um, and maybe even I probably would have been surprised if he reacted, if he reacted that heavily to anyone of any age of any network yeah. asking that question. Yeah. Um, it was pretty astounding, but still the, probably the favourite interview I've ever done just because yeah. of that. Yeah, no, your follow-up questions were, were very good. You, you managed to push him back onto those challenges and um, I guess direct him to the parts of those questions he hadn't answered and phrase them in a different way that sort of challenged him further. So that was, it was amazing to watch, you know. As someone who's done a lot of interviews, I was like, wow, <laughs> this is amazing. And you... you you could have been so nervous as well, but it, it really didn't look like you did. And I mean, you've even been on Q&A, which I think is, is probably one of the most challenging panel shows to go on and really hold your own and in that context of a big crowd and, and you know, usually pretty high powered guests around you to hold your own in that forum as well. What Was that nerve wracking? Do you get nervous? Because you, you can never see it. I, I, I don't think anymore. I get nervous. I mean, you know, maybe a bit initially, but at this point, I think it's just, it's an, it's another day, right? And Q&A, Q&A was, was, was great um, behind the scenes. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. You know, I think the most nervous I was actually was on the way there because um, we were stuck in traffic outside um, <laughs> South Bank trying to actually get into the studio and we rocked up to the wrong garage and we're trying to get in there. You can imagine I've got my, my parents in the car who are there trying to, you know, because they want to be in the audience um, and th- so that, that was probably the most nervous part of it, actually getting there on time. I probably consider myself, you know, not, not the best with time management. Um, but, um, yeah, I think it, it, it is, it, it's fun. It's always enjoyable. And Q- Q&A was a great experience, um, to, to be able to on that panel, panel to meet a minister, you know? Yeah. Just before we move on from Scott Morrison, um, given what you saw as of his performance all around as prime minister, but also the sort of insight you got from speaking to him directly and the way he handled that interview. Why do you think he's not prime minister anymore? Um, I think, you know, the handling of, of the bushfires and then all the parliament house scandals and in 2021, um, and then obviously the way, you know, um, plenty of women around Australia were feeling about it. I think that that sank him. Um, Mm. probably everything probably started to go downhill from the bushfires his only spike was um, his performance, at least in the polls, was was pretty decent during the early stages of COVID. Um, by May 2022, I think people were sick of him, um, and uh, and Anthony Albanese managed to to I think, you know, channel a lot of that that anger and talk talk about a, a new vision. And he was he was pretty good in that sense, but also it helps that the crossbench took a bunch of those liberal seats as do, well. Do you think what the the side of him you saw in that interview was part of I guess a, a character flaw that is part of the reason he's not prime minister anymore. Look, I, I can never be one to judge other people's characters too much, but I don't think it helped. I'll say that. I think um, 
I don't think many people would look at an interview like that with his reaction and think, oh, good on you, ScoMo, you show those children. You know, I think the reaction would be, um, is the Prime Minister really talking to a journalist, let alone two journalists, let alone 14 and 13 year old journalists like that? Um, which I think is a fairly understandable reaction. Mm. Okay, Anthony Albanese, you interviewed him as well. How do you think he's going as Prime Minister? Because polling is not looking good. It's it's down to a level where they might just win a minority government. They certainly win, wouldn't win a majority government with where their polling's at now. Why do you think that is? Um, I think it's a combination of factors, cost of living, which you can argue he can do something you know, dramatically about compared to a coalition government or not. There's only so much that obviously one can, can do there. So cost of living is a huge issue, which goes into the housing issue. Um, and then there's always, you know, I guess, I wouldn't necessarily want to say smaller issues, but there's the other issues that aren't necessarily Australian domestic. Um, obviously, um, what's happening in Gaza is probably changing a few people's minds in, in terms of labour. I know there's been plenty of um, division within labour, especially in those first few months after October 7 in terms of, of ceasefire calls. We, we were covering that pretty extensively, so that um, probably hasn't helped. Um, but I think he's probably going to be fine in terms of the next election. In terms, I, I think If I had to guess, I think it would be a minority. I think it would be a Labor minority because the crossbench is probably much more inclined to align with Labor in terms of if you look at the Greens numbers, you look at the Teal numbers, and each Teal is different, but there's def definitely some who'd lean Labor, I'd say, more than they'd lean Liberal. Um, and even Diley and Frank Carbone Network and Catters Australian, who knows, they, they could even <laughs> go Labor if, if, if really need be. Um, and then it doesn't help that I don't think Peter Dutton is or has ever been shown in the polls to be that popular as a preferred Prime Minister. Mm. Um, and that's probably another factor. You know, I think a one-term government um, is is very, very unlikely. Yeah. Granted, of course, after one term of, of Rudd Gillard, it became a minority, but that's still a, that was still a Labor government. So yeah, mm -hmm. I don't think we're getting the coalition back in power, federally at least, any time soon. Um, and part of that is because of who Anthony Albanese isn't, and he isn't Peter Dutton. Hmm. So what's your read on your own generation? You're almost, you're almost like an undercover reporter for the the rest of us playing along you know you, you're still in high school you're amongst it you you're hearing what's said in the classrooms in the playground you've also obviously got some feedback coming through from your channel how are teenage Australians seeing the state of Australian politics and who who looks good and who looks, looks bad from that perspective I think evidently it's obviously the the trend towards um, progressive parties seems mm. to be pretty well well documented I think that's true um, taking into account I'm in Hawthorne near Richmond, so you get, I'm like in a teal and a green area, although Liberals at a state level, but I digress. Um, so I think it, it, it definitely leaning away from the Liberal Party. I think ScoMo was, I think for a lot of people who are maybe not tuned in politically, you know, probably around my age, um, you know, pretty laughable um, in terms of his last few years of, of, of as Prime Minister. I think people would have looked at it. Again, the yelling at the 14-year-old didn't help that. <laughs> um, so I think that that's probably helped them lean towards uh, towards Labor Greens. I'm sure there's a, more than a few who are pretty apathetic about politics as well. But I, I don't see a, a natural turn towards the, the Liberals. Um, I think of the 2025 you know, federal election, I expect it to be 2025 anyway, um, you know, that'll probably be reflected in there'll be um, a lot of these areas with a younger population that are maybe these marginal Labor Green seats that'll tip Greens. We'll have to wait and mm -hmm. see on that. But uh, yeah, def it definitely, I think people are saying that at least in Australia, Gen, Gen Z seems to be trending a bit more progressive. I think that's a probably right. A bit more or, or a lot more? Because I've, I've read some research that it's, it's going so hardcore in the progressive direction, they don't ever see it really coming back to the kind of balance that it, it was. And, you know, there's obviously the old, the old idea that you're progressive when you're younger and more conservative as you get older. But some of the research is pointing to a, a, a deeper change in our political values that will last beyond that, that generational change. Well, look, it might be a lot more. I say a bit more purely because, as I said, already in the Greens area, there's only so much more that they can go um, to make a, a significant difference. You know, it's a safe Adam Bant seat. Um, so I think, yeah, definitely there's, there's a fair bit more um, going in the green direction. But I think also the, the old vote the way your parents did, I think that's still true. Not necessarily for a majority, but there's still a fair chunk that are like that for, for better or worse um, nationwide. 
Um, and so I think that's a factor. But of course, if you're in a green seat and you're voting the way your parents did, then you're more than likely than not to be ending up progressive. So I guess it's a seat by seat thing. But I think with the we've seen the climate change um, rallies, the student strikes for climate mm. um, and all that. So definitely. And a lot of that, again, was strong anti-liberal uh, when you're a member of uh, the Morrison with his with his coal in parliament and all that. So, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to, to see how that pans out. Um, and I will say among that, even if the election is at its latest possible date next year, September 2025, um, I will still not be eligible to vote. I hmm. turn 18 in November 2025. So for my federal election, I probably have to wait till 2028, which is a little annoying. But, mm. uh, yeah. Okay, so speaking of Gen, Gen Z, the other thing you read, particularly in more conservative media outlets, is that there's this concern about um, children being sort of dragged into the woke agenda in high schools. Do you see any evidence of that? Look, I'll say this, and of course, I can only speak from my experience. I do go to, I won't obviously give away my school. It is a government school. Um, I, I, I don't think anything in terms of being dragged into it by the department or by teachers that I've at least seen. Um, the people at my school who post something on a, on a socially progressive thing or repost the Greens or post something on pro-Palestine or anything like that, that's just something driven by social media. Mm. That is not being hammered in by um, by by the schools um, and I think you know at least at least at my school you know you know we, it's it's just a yeah we, we, we for example like I'm, I'm doing a class on on the Russian Revolution right now mm-hmm. and you know our teacher isn't isn't hammering in communist ideology <laughs> at us right isn't all this pro-bolshevik propaganda around the classrooms it's just teaching it how any teacher would teach it um, so I don't think at least at my school it's being hammered in um, I think the reason maybe students are going woke um, is because of social media, is because of what they're seeing there, um, for better or worse. It's not, at least that I've seen, being actually driven by the schools. Um, so you have to look at social media and you can't exactly shut down any all the progressive content on Instagram and TikTok. And Instagram and TikTok is where they're getting it from. Forget Facebook, forget Twitter. Um, Instagram and TikTok is is huge in that area. And is that, do you think, is there any sort of external influence there? Is that about the algorithms? Is it about who's posting the content? Or, or is what's being shared on those platforms just a reflection of what young people are talking about and, and where they land on these issues? I think it is the latter. I mean, there was the headline from a couple months ago where um, it was something along the lines of TikTok says they are not influencing the algorithm. Gen Z is just pro-Palestine um, and something like that. Uh it's part of, I guess it's part of that. Maybe so you would agree with that? You would agree with that sentiment? I think they're definitely leaning towards um, pro-Palestine for those who are actually informed on the issue than not, um, or at least on TikTok. I, I get a range of videos on TikTok. On Instagram, though, it's almost, it's, it's, it's hard to describe, but, um, you know, the, the way uh, uh, certain social media accounts target in terms of their, their looks, their designs, you know, a lot of these progressive Instagram accounts, they, they kind of look the same in their messaging and their, their style and their graphics, they're all really just Canva templates. Um, but those go viral on Instagram for whatever reason, and naturally they're shared back. Um, and so maybe it started a few years ago, but I don't think, you know, people are just randomly getting pro-Palestine stuff on their feeds out of out of completely nowhere. It's, it's probably just based on a trend, based on how Gen Z is going at the moment. Uh, of course, we'll have to wait and see on that. You know, we, we, we only have opinion polls to go with, right? You know, we have the secret ballot. I can't be checking every, every Gen Z vote. We can, we can see how they'd go. But, um, you know, I think, again, it, it, the progressive trend for Gen Z is, is definitely there. Um, and I don't think that will change anytime soon. Yeah. Why do you think that trend exists? Why, why are young people going more and more progressive? Again, partly because of that's what they're seeing on social media. Um, again, partly because of, of how parents have voted. Uh, again, partly because of, of demographics. Um, but I think also when you're seeing or you're being told, again, whether you agree or not, that there are big climate problems when you see someone who you might be inspired by. Because I think a lot of young people, if they look at someone else around the same age talking about the same thing, they're probably more inclined to listen mm. or at least agree. Um, I think that's a big part of it. I think when Greta Thunberg, like in 2019, when she was everywhere after that, mm. that one, the how dare you speech, right? That was, when you look back at it, that was insane how much attention that speech got. Um, and that contributed to um, a lot of it because they're seeing another young person 
um, talking about it, or maybe they're seeing one of their friends talking about it because of that. So it, it, it's, it's a few factors. I can't point it down to one single thing, um, but social media spreads it. Yeah. So the conservative critique of the Greta Thunberg sort of phenomenon is that she's sort of inducing young people with climate anxiety in a way that's, you know, in a bad way, in an unhealthy way. Um, do you see it that way? Look, it, it's it's subjective, right? Um, I think no one can doubt really that she's passionate about what she says and what she does. And I think I think she's over eighteen now. She's she's been doing it for for quite some time. It's clear she cares about it. Um, and maybe maybe she does want young people to to listen to her speeches like that um, to to get the message out. Um, clearly, it's probably worked. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it, it it's just it's it's just. It, whether whether it's deliberate or not, it does appeal when you see your own age group talking about it, or when you mm. see someone reflective of of yourself, um, you know, talking about this issue or getting attention because they talk about this issue, um, and that's probably why you know her name's her name's out there so much um, because she was able to be on that, and that's why also so many of these other um, rallies we see um, are, are, are driven by by students. There was the school strike for Palestine the other the other day. And and that's everywhere, at least on on social media. Mm. So it, it it social media drives it, other young people drive it, and I guess maybe it's a bit of a cycle. But um, you know, we'll we'll have to wait and see. Once most of Gen Z, I'm not sure how many percentage yet, but once most of Gen Z is actually able to vote, um, then I think it'll be really interesting to see in the next federal election cycle in terms of how that pans out for young people. Will be mm. an incredibly interesting watch. Okay, so just to touch on your last the last big name that you've had on. On Six News, Kevin Rudd, he's gotten into a bit of um, bit of a bother recently. He's the ambassador for Washington, but Trump said he wouldn't be in the job much longer given he'd been very critical of Donald Trump. Very, very critical, very outspoken Kevin Rudd, as you probably know after following the news yeah. and interviewing him. Do you think he can stay in that job if Trump becomes president? I think he can because I'm still not sure Trump actually knows who he is. Right. Or, or... You think he's just responding to what was laden in that question from Nigel Farage? Pretty much, yeah. It was a it was a pretty kind of generic response. Um, I think I, I don't think Trump's gonna I necessarily remember to to expel Rudd or anything like that. Um, I I I think look maybe he will, um, but uh, clearly obviously Rudd's been outspoken in that element. Um, maybe for better or worse, he was chosen. Um, he's got those issues there. Obviously, Trump returning as president is a yeah you know, pretty realistic um, possibility. Mm. Um, so it could be gone, but again, I'm just really not sure Trump actually knows that much, if anything, about about a former prime minister. I think even Nigel Farage mentioned him as a ex-Labor MP, not PM, MP. Um, so I don't... I, I, I just... It was it was a fairly random mention, but um, it was... I know... I mean, it was Sky News apparently asked Farage to bring him up, so, you know, that's interesting. But, uh, yeah, mm. it'll be interesting to see how Rudd goes with it. I think... Um, um, I'm, I, I can't say I, I imagine that he'd hate to be able to be more outspoken when not in an ambassador role again. Yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily that Trump will go, oh, that's, I've got to get rid of that guy. Not, it's not really his decision to make, although he could make it very hard for him to continue in that job. But it's really a question of whether Rudd can still be effective in having any influence over the administration. But that's a whole other debate, um, probably for a, you know, a foreign affairs program. Before we go... Last question. You've come into the news. You've done it very early in life. You're doing it in some ways very much in a new media way, especially technically. But as we've discussed, you're bringing a very old-fashioned style of journalism to a new media market. Are you wanting to change the media? What is there something you want to change? Are there things you don't like about the media that you want to improve on? Look, Never when I started this, and as I said, it was a pretty random rise to, to getting some, some notability. Never set out to change the whole landscape. Um, I think indirectly we may have. The fact that I'm able to see, see social media posts that just mention six news and other people know what, we're talk- what they're talking about um, is pretty ast- outstanding, that we've got, mm. uh, astounding that we've got that name recognition. Um, so, I mean, look, obviously there's a few elements that maybe I don't like. You know, I've never been a fan of... Of, of huge clickbait or scaremongering or anything like that. Um, but at the same time, if the other media want to keep doing it, then be my guest because more and more people will start to turn for us because we don't do that. 
um, and that's something I'm, I'm incredibly proud of. So it'll be interesting. I think the media landscape is changing, whether I want it to or not, or whether I'm trying to get it to change or not. It's obviously going more digital. Mm. And the fact that we're not adapting from TV to digital, we've always been digital, we're mm. all digital, um, is probably a big, big boost for us. So how many job offers have you had from big media companies? Oh, well, I, I think I'll, I'll give the same response I gave to Crikey the other week. Um, I, can, I can never talk about, about you know, what, what other <laughs> offers people would give me or not. Um, I'm always happy to, to collaborate and work, but I'll say the Six News you know, isn't, isn't going anywhere anytime soon. You know, I'll be here for the next federal election. Is it for sale? Is Six News for sale? No, absolutely not. You, you'd, have to, you'd have to pull up with a, a dump truck full of money and and you know deliver it on the doorstep for me but um no, we're not going anywhere well I'm, people are trying to reach young audiences so maybe they will pull up with a bit of money maybe maybe we'll look we'll take some sponsors but um you know i don't i don't think i don't think rupert murdoch's going to be writing a check for us anytime soon <laughs> well let's hope he writes it further down the track and it's even bigger um great to speak to you leo thanks so much for your time great to be here thanks so much sweet all right that was a great conversation thank you mate Hey, that was another episode of The Weekend Briefing. I really hope you liked it. If you did, um, please um, like this video, drop us a comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more of these big interviews with the humans behind the headlines.